Roger, Eagle. Go for landing, over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. Eagle looking great. Houston, the Eagle has landed. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Storytellers. I'm Graham Nolan, your host. Uh, some big news came up uh, in, in the storytelling world, in the pop culture world, uh, as of January 1st. And that was Mickey Mouse came into public domain. And there's a lot of questions about what, what that actually means. And so I thought today uh, we would go over in, in a deep dive exactly what public domain means. Uh, what copyright is versus trademark, and uh, how it affects moving forward if you want to use this character. Uh, there's some historical stuff I think is very interesting uh, about the subject as well, and uh, we're going to dive right into it. And the first thing I think we should touch upon is um, the copyright laws, you know, how those came about and what they are currently. Um, so, if we have any super chats or anything like that, uh, I'm I'm not going to break the stream to cover them. We'll, we'll cover them at the end, uh, so we can keep the flow going because there's a lot of information that we're going to want to uh, want to cover. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's just say hello to some of the folks that are in the chat here, and let's see who's here. Uh, Norn Red Two, William Brown, uh, Two Ways Time, A Siege Perilous. Chris Juliano is here. Cool, cool. Fritzy Schnitzel, who wishes that someone would use the original Mickey to critique the modern degenerate Disney. <laughs> uh, Stat Zero, haven't seen Stat in a while. Good to see you. Citizen Ronan, Cigar Gangster, uh, Dan Genovese, uh, Happy New Year to you too. Uh, Nick Capello, hello, Nick. Okay, um, so first off, what is the copyright laws? Okay, so back in 1909, we had uh, uh, copyright laws in this country that uh, had a set date. Um, and, and those uh, continued on up until, those laws continued up until about 1976. Uh, and following the, the Copyright Act of 1976, which is a landmark one, um, a copyright would last 50 years after the author's death or 75 years past publication. Uh, under this law, Mickey Mouse was due to come into the public domain in 2004. So then we get the Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998, which extended those terms and works after 1923. Now, Steamboat Willie and Mickey Mouse came out in 1928. All works after 1923, but before 1978, are protected for 95 years from the date of publication. And going forward, works created after January 1st of 1978 will be protected for 70 years past the death of the author. Uh, this, this was known, this copyright term extension, was known as the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998. Yes, that's Sonny Bono of Sonny and Cher fame. And where was Sonny a congressman? California. And what else is in California? Uh, the Walt Disney Corporation. So uh, they were constituents of his. Uh, this Sonny Bono Copyright Act term extension, or the, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 also has another name. It's called the Mickey Mouse Extension Act. And uh, I think it's pretty obviously why it was uh, called that. Uh, Disney has been able to hold on uh, as well as any other copyright people, but, but Disney's been a powerful driver of the Extension Act. And uh, we know why, you know, they, they don't want to give up the mouse. Um, but they're not really giving up the mouse, even though it's come into into uh, uh, public domain as of January 1st, uh, Monday at midnight, uh, or yeah, well, I guess it would be Sunday at midnight. Um, uh, there's still a lot that uh, you have to watch out for, uh, and we're going to dive deep into that. Uh, one of the uh, best articles I came across uh, was from uh, the, the, the Duke Law. 
Duke University. Um, it's a very comprehensive article about copyright in Disney uh, and um, uh, some of the uh, interesting uh, machinations that went into it. And we're going to we're going to go over this article together tonight. Um, it was written by Jennifer Jenkins, who's the director of Duke Center for the Study of Public Domain. So these are folks that understand in and out what public domain is. So if you're a creator out there and you're thinking of using uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, these are the things you need to watch out for. And these are the things that you will be allowed to do. And you'd be surprised how broad it is. Uh, so let's start off. Um, on January 1st, 2024, after almost a century of copyright protection, Mickey Mouse, or at least a version of Mickey Mouse, will enter the United States public domain, which it has. The first movies in which the iconic mouse appeared, Steamboat Willie, and the silent version of Plain Crazy were made in 1928, and works from that year go into the public domain in the U.S. on New Year's Day 2024. Again, it's already happened. Um, now, this article is only about U.S. law. Uh, and other countries uh, have different uh, um, uh, copyright laws. Uh, in fact, they they seem to be less stringent than U.S. copyright laws, because I know that Conan the Barbarian uh, is already in public domain over in Europe. Um, so uh, public uh, domain has some had some famous recent arrivals, and this is the most anticipated entry yet. Why? It is not simply that Mickey is a famous copyrighted character, so are Sherlock Holmes and Winnie the Pooh. And while they entered the public domain with some fanfare, it paled in comparison to this event. Um, and she'd like to offer a tentative answer. The reason for that this event gathers so much attention is that it is the story of a 95-year-old love triangle, a, tr a tangled drama that rivals any Disney movie for twists and turns. The protagonists are Mickey, Disney, and the public domain, and their relationship positively exemplifies the social media weasel words, it's complicated. <laughs> She's a good writer, right? On one hand, Disney pushed for the law that extended the copyright term to 95 years, which became referred to derisively as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act. This extension has been criticized by scholars as being economically regressive, and having a devastating effect on our ability to digitize, archive, and gain access to our cultural heritage. It locked up not just famous works, but a vast swath of our culture, including material that is commercially unavailable. Even though calling it the Mickey Mouse Protection Act may overstate Disney's actual role in the legislative process, the measure passed because of a much broader lobbying effect. Disney was certainly a prominent supporter, and the mouse was sometimes a figurehead. On the other hand, Disney itself is a talented and successful practitioner of building upon the public domain. Now, this is very interesting and, and somewhat ironic, if, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. In fact, the public domain in Disney's bread is bre Disney's bread and butter. Frozen was inspired by Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen. The Lion King draws from Shakespeare's Hamlet, biblical stories, and possibly an epic poem about the founder of the Mali Empire. Fantasia's The Sorcerer's Apprentice comes from a poem by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And in other segments, the Fantasia film showcases little public, uh, uh, public domain classical music. Alice in Wonderland, Snow White, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, The Little Mermaid, and Pinocchio all came from stories by Lewis Carroll, the Brothers Grimm, Victor Hugo, Charles Perrault, Hans Christian Andersen, and Carlo Collodi. Uh, again, <laughs> all open uh, for, for their use. The public domain includes not only works over which copyright has expired or never existed, but also uncopyrightable aspects of contemporary works, such as ideas, stock elements, and unoriginal material. The Mickey character itself is based on such public domain fodder. His personality and antics drew from silent film stars such as Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks. Walt Disney told the American magazine, I think we were rather indebted to Charlie Chaplin. We wanted something appealing, and we thought of a tiny bit of a mouse that would have something of the wistfulness of, Cha of Chaplin, a little fellow trying to do the best he could. Ub Iwerks, who animated most of Steamboat Willie, wrote that Douglas Fairbanks was the superhero of his day, 
always winning, gallant, and swashbuckling. Mickey's action was in that vein. I thought of him in that respect, and I had him uh, do naturally the sort of thing Douglas Fairbanks, Doug Fairbanks would do. Titles are also not copyrightable, and the name Steamboat Willie was a nod to the title of Buster Keaton's film from the earlier year, Steamboat Bill Jr. Uh, so this is a lot of stuff people don't realize because of how old it is. Uh, but if you you know are a fan of silent films, you know these names and you know uh, uh, the derivation um, uh, of where um, Steamboat Willie and Mickey Mouse came from. Hence the triangle. Disney is both an emblem of term extension and its erosion of the public domain. And one of the strongest use cases in favor of the main maintenance of a rich public domain. Mickey is the symbol of both tendencies. Ironies abound. It may not be exactly the same as an oil company relying on solar power to run its rigs, <laughs> but it definitely in the same massive irony zip code. All of this makes the year when copyright finally expires over Mickey Mouse highly symbolic. The love triangle between Mickey, Disney, and the public domain is about to evolve and perhaps even resolve in real time. But what does public domain status actually mean for the Steamboat Willie version of Mickey? There's a vast amount of misinformation about these issues online. In what follows, I will try to offer a straightforward explainer. What can and can't be done or do with the Mickey Mouse character? Uh, how will Disney be affected? Disney d still holds copyrights over later versions of, di of Mickey. Does trademark law play a role? Keep reading for details. Ooh. Exciting stuff. So now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. That's a little backstory in history uh, of Mickey Mouse and, and, and the public domain uses they used in the creation of this character. So Steamboat Willie and the characters it depicts both include Mickey Mouse and Mickey and Minnie Mouse. Uh, uh, courts have made clear that when a story falls in the public domain, story elements, including characters covered by the expired copyright, become fair game for follow-on authors. As indicated in the green circle, this means that anyone can share, adapt, or remix that material. You can start your creative engines, too. Full steam ahead. You could take a page out of the Winnie the Pooh Deforested Edition playbook and create Steamboat Willie, the Climate Change Edition, in which Mickey's boat is grounded in a dry riverbed. You could create a feminist remake with Minnie Mouse as the central figure. You could reimagine Mickey and Minnie and dedicate themselves to animal welfare. And these are all really shitty ideas, by the way. <laughs> but you could do it. Uh, I think it would be cool to do a Mickey Mouse vampire hunter or, or Mickey Mouse, um, uh, you know, in space or, you know, some kind of fun adventure stuff with the character. Uh, you can do all this and more so long as you steer clear of the subsisting rights indicated by the RN circles. Okay. Trademark, you cannot use Mickey in a way that misleads consumers into thinking your work is produced or sponsored by Disney. Okay, we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, you cannot use new copyrightable versions of Mickey until those copyrights expire. So, as an example, you see the picture of... Mickey here. Um, he has no gloves. Uh, he has no color. Uh, if you drew Mickey with the uh, eyes with the pupils, uh, that's a no-no also because those are later additions that uh, that can't be touched yet. So uh, if you drew, drew Mickey with gloves, uh, again, that's, a, a, that's not in public domain. Um, the color you know, uh, there, well, there's some aspects about that in the, uh, uh, further down the, in the article about the color scheme uh, and whether or not that is copyrightable or not. But anyway, um, you, uh, da, 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 you can use all this and more as long as you steer clear of the subsisting rights indicated by the orange circles, namely, Use the original versions of Mickey and Minnie Mouse from 1928 without copyrightable elements or later iterations, though not every later iteration will be copyrightable, as uh, she explains below. And do not confuse consumers into thinking that your creation is produced or sponsored by Disney as a matter of trademark law. 
One way to ensure that your audience is not confused is to make the actual source of the work you or your company clear on the title screen or cover, along with a prominent disclaimer indicating that your work was not produced, endorsed, licensed, or approved by Disney. So if I was to do a Disney comic book, you know, like I said, Disney uh, or uh, Mickey, Mickey Mouse Vampire Hunter, uh, it would have the Compass Comics logo on it uh, um, prominently which would cover me uh, from anybody thinking that this was a Disney uh, thing. Um, so uh, was Monday doomsday for Disney? <laughs> no, Disney still retains copyright over newer iterations of Mickey, such as the Sorcerer's Apprentice, Mickey from Fantasia, as well as trademarks over Mickey as a brand identifier. Uh, people will still go to its theme parks, pay to see its movies, buy its merchandise. Its brand identity will remain intact. In some, yes, you can use Mickey in new creative works. There are some more complex peripheral legal issues, but here is your guide through them. Okay, here's an example of the, the first two are the 1928 version. You can do either one of those because they're both covered uh, under uh, public domain. Next year, this one, uh, where he has the glint, the highlight in his eyes, and the gloves on his hands. Um, will be available. So it'll be some time before you get the Sorcerer's Apprentice and, and these other versions where Mickey's got the, the white uh, uh, the white eyes with the black pupils. Um, in 2024, Mickey Mouse joins a host of other familiar public domain characters. Winnie the Pooh, Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, Frankenstein's Monster, Robin Hood, Snow White, Cinderella, and Alice in Wonderland. You can use Mickey and Minnie 1.0 as they appeared in Steamboat Willie and Playing Crazy, even though these characters also appear in later still copyrighted works under copyright law. Disney only owns the newly added material in subsequent works, not underlying material from 1928. That contains that content remains freely available. So that's, a, that's an important point. Uh, this point was illustrated by the Conan Doyle estates. Um, unsuccessful attempts to artificially extend the expired copyright over the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson uh, covered on last year's public domain day site. So they publish this every January 1st, uh, which is public domain day. As every year goes by, more, more uh, properties fall under uh, the auspices of, of uh, public domain. A court confirmed that all the story elements in public domain works are free for public use where an author has used the same character in a series of, wor of works, some of which are in the public domain, the public is free to copy story elements from the public domain works. So you can take public, uh, you can take elements from out of uh, Steamboat Willie, whatever you want, uh, and use them however you'd like. Uh, Mickey's appearance has changed over time, going from vaguely rat-like to a more uh, uh, no tenuous uh, appearance. His eyes varied over time and began as large white ovals with pupils in Plain Crazy and smaller black dots in Steamboat Willie, which, by the way, was my favorite version. Um, I really like that look with the with the black dots. Um, I would just like to add the gloves. Uh, maybe the 1929 version, I think, is like the ultimate Mickey to me. Um, both those versions of Mickey are public domain in 2024. In 1929, he quickly donned gloves, apparently so that his hands were more visible against his body. And later he was colorized, which that was a good move, by the way, uh, uh, because, you know, there was no holding lines. So the black against the black, his hands would disappear whenever it crossed uh, anything dark. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. The overall appearance of Fantasia Mickey and other Lady Mickeys is still under copyright. OK, we covered that. Um, that said, not every feature of Mickey's later iterations is individually copyrightable. Copyright only extends to original creative expression. Mere ideas are not eligible, nor are unoriginal features or stock elements. When copyright is claimed over additions to pre-existing content, such as changes to the 1928 Mickey character, those changes have to be more than a merely trivial, trivial or minuscule variation on what came before. 
It is not enough for the new material just to be different. It has to meet copyright's threshold requirements for protectability. Therefore, while the safest approach may be to stick to Mickey era 1928 in new creations, copyright law also lets you use later material that does not qualify for copyright. Your mouse can speak intelligently in a high voice, even though Mickey 1.0 does not do so. Giving a talking mouse a squeaky voice is not copyrightable. Generic character traits such as being adorable and having less jaunty dance moves are fair game. What's more, anything you independently create or come up with yourself is legal. Choosing your own color scheme is fine. You do not have to stick to black and white. Can Disney claim copyright over the color red, standing alone for Mickey shorts? Uh, on the one hand, we're talking about copyright's originality requirement. The su Supreme Court said that the requisite level of creativity is extremely low. Even a slight amount will suffice. The vast majority of works make the grade quite easily as they possess some creative spark, no matter how crude, humble, or obvious it might be. But the law is also clear that adding something to a prior work must be more than a merely trivial variation. To us, the argument seems stronger that choosing a single bright primary color for an article of clothing does not meet the copyrightable threshold. That said, you may be more comfortable selecting your own color scheme. Um, this article shows a fully colorized poster of Mickey Mouse made in 1928, but it's not clear if the poster was published for copyright purposes in 28. So we don't have the information necessary, blah, blah, blah. Um, personally, I'd avoid those colors. Uh, because those versions of Disney are used, uh, 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 of Mickey are used as trademarks and, uh, where you're going to run into any kind of problem with Disney lawyers is over trademark infringement and they're going to come hard. So, uh, I would give him either a whole new outfit or, uh, a, a different color scheme entirely. Uh, for his, his pants, his gloves, his shoes. You can give him a hat, whatever. Uh, note that public domain enables all sorts of remakes. In the short term, buzzworthy reuses such as horror films tend to attract attention because of the shock value in, in and incongruity with the original characters. There's already a horror movie uh, I saw a commercial for tonight. In the long term, however, our culture gets to decide what kind of kinds of remakes stand the test of time and retain cultural resonance. Think of all the other public domain children's characters that Mickey is joining. Alice in Wonderland, Snow White, Cinderella, Pinocchio, Santa Claus. What reimaginings come to mind? All of the beloved and artistic movies by Disney and others. These are the kind of uses that have been rewarded in the marketplace and maintained enduring appeal. So, uh, let's just, uh, stop there for a sec. And, uh, let me just check in here on the chat make sure, uh, I haven't missed anything. We're still streaming. That's good. <laughs> uh, let's see. let's see if there's any questions here that have cropped up over what we've covered. Uh, uh, Nate Greenberg has brought his law degree. Okay, Nate's a lawyer. So uh, if I say anything that uh, uh, you find uh, wrong, uh, call me out on it, Nate. Uh, two Waste Time says, WBDC is doomed when the Superman Batman domain happens. Well, that's not really true because, again, all that's going to become available in 20. Uh, 2034, that's when uh, Superman will uh, come into public domain, is that uh, the, only the elements that appeared in Action Comics number one. So the trademark S, can't use it. Even his boots you can't use. Uh, Superman had like, um, almost like Greek sandals. They were like a boot with a with a tie up, up his, up his leg. Um, there was no mention of Krypton. He worked for the Daily Star. There was no Perry White. Uh, there, was, uh, there was Lois Lane. Um, so uh, he couldn't fly. Uh, he wasn't that strong. So there's a lot of elements of Superman uh, that everybody knows. That um, And the same thing for Batman. Uh, when the following year, 
when the, the, only what was available in detective comics that year uh, uh, of 1939 uh, would be usable. And I, I, I should go back to say that uh, it's not just action comics, number one. It was every action comics that was published in 1938. Uh, but I don't think they mentioned Krypton until 39 uh, when they gave Superman's origin in uh, Superman number one. So I don't think DC is, is worried too much uh, uh, at that point. But as the years go on, yeah, obviously, you know, more and more stuff is going to become available. And then Sonny hit a tree. <laughs> that is true. Uh, he ran into a tree while skiing. <laughs> Dr. Mass says uh, the company that has spent its whole life raiding the public domain is crying about the public domain. Yeah. Fritzy Snitzel asks why public domain is a good thing. Why shouldn't the estate of the creator keep the rights to his, her creations in perpetuity? Um, well, the point of it is to sp spur uh, more creativity, is that uh, these things uh, become bigger than the uh, – because you have to renew copyrights. You know, So if, if, if you've created some loser character nobody cared about, you're not going to renew the copyright and it's going to fall into public domain early. Um, but it, it's to, it, it's to uh, get other creative people – uh, access to some of these things that are part of culture, a part of our culture, and come up with different ideas and 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 to move the creative process forward. That's the the, the point of of these things lapsing, and you know that's a lot of years, ninety five years. That's a long time. I mean, you you have you know family members at that point that uh, uh, you know your family should be well off <laughs> by then. All right, so didn't know I was Irish. <laughs> Graham Patrick Nolan, please. Okay, so we can come back to some of these things. I'm not seeing any major questions here. So let's go back to our article, shall we? Okay. Now we get into the thicket. What about Disney's trademark over Mickey? What about it? The plot thickens when you add Disney's trademark rights to the picture. Many sources claim that even though Mickey is copyright free in 2024, you still cannot use the character because it is trademarked by Disney. But this is not what the law actually says. So that's the kind of stuff you hear on the Internet all the time. And one of the major things I wanted to, to uh, talk about here is is there's a lot of stuff going on, on the Internet. Um and, and, and she points out that that is not what the law says. Trademark law only prohibits the use of a trademarked character if doing so is likely to cause confusion or to cause mistake or to deceive consumers about the source or sponsorship of the new product. So that goes back to making sure that if you do a comic, you have your own publishing brand on there and there's no mention of Disney. Or if you were to do a, a movie, uh, or or a, a cartoon uh, using the character um, that you make it clear uh, uh, right up front that this is not a Disney production. Um, okay, some background. Uh, copyrights and trademarks are different. 
Copyrights cover creative works and prevent people from copying and adapting them without permission, with the goal of providing economic incentives to create and distribute cultural material. Uh, the U.S. Constitution requires that these rights expire after a limited time so that the public and future creators can have unfettered access to creative works. Okay, there you go. That goes to the question I think it was Fritzy Schnitzel was asking. Uh, trademarks uh, cover words, logos, images, and other signifiers that serve as brands identifying the source of a product. The goal is to minimize consumer confusion in the marketplace. Nike can prevent other producers of athletic apparel from putting Nike or a swoosh on their merchandise so that when purchasers see those indicators, they know they are getting a Nike product. But it does not own the word Nike outright. There are lots of uses of Nike that do not violate trademark, whether referring to the Greek goddess of victory or to the brand in a non-confusing way. That's very important. Unlike copyrights, trademarks do not automatically expire. They can last as long as a mark is still being used in commerce. If Amazon goes on using Amazon brand for 500 years, the trademark stays alive. While trademarks can outlast copyrights, however, the rights themselves are more circumscribed. For most marks, trademark law only prevents the use of a mark on similar products when it is likely to create consumer confusion about the product's origin or sponsorship. Non-confusing uses are not prohibited, and there are a variety of legal safeguards for uses of trademarks in connection with expressive works such as films, books, and songs. So when you file a trademark, you have to list what that trademark is for. And, you know, most companies try to list everything they can think of. But uh, let's say you skip out uh, on games uh, and don't list it. Uh, somebody can use that name for a game uh, because it wasn't covered. Sometimes copyrights and trademarks overlap. A character such as Mickey Mouse and Winnie the Pooh might be covered both by copyright law as a creative work and trademark law as a logo if when people see the character on a backpack or pajamas, they think it must be official Disney merchandise. While the copyright is active, Disney can keep people from making unauthorized uses of Mickey in new works, unless those uses qualify for fair use protection as with parody. While the trademark is in effect, Disney can keep people from slapping Mickey on luggage or apparel. But what happens when the copyright expires and the trademark is ongoing? It is a unanimous opinion the Supreme Court made clear that trademarks cannot be used to make an end run around copyright law because this would create a species of mutant copyright law that limits the public's federal right to copy and to use expired copyrights. In other words, trademark rights cannot be used to block the freedoms that the expiration of copyright allows, such as using a public domain character in a new creative work. Along the same lines, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals explained that when a work enters the public domain, we all own it now. And trademark law cannot be used to circumvent copyright law. If material covered by copyright law was passed into the public domain, it cannot then be protected by the Lan uh, Lantham, Lanham, Lanham? Lanham Act. <laughs> it took a few tries. Uh, the federal trademark statute without rendering the Copyright Act a nullity. Those who tell you otherwise are mistaken. So again, very important part right there. Because if that was to happen, then you're, in, in effect, putting it back under copyright because trademark is is giving you an extra umbrella, and that can be in perpetuity, uh, and that's not what the law is for. Uh, this brings us to Mickey Mouse, the Steamboat Willie copyright. Uh, yeah, we know. Uh, but Disney still retains trademark rights to use images of Mickey as well as the words Mickey Mouse in connection with a variety of prod uh, products. Here are some of its federally registered uh, Mickey images for merchandise, such as clothing, backpacks, watches, linens, toys, blankets, lunch boxes, and water bottles. So these are registered trademark images. Disney has also started using this logo before some of its films. Yeah, that's no accident. <laughs> 
If you make your own Mickey cartoon, can Disney use a trademark law to interfere? Trademark law is about preventing consumer confusion, and not about getting in the way of creativity. So it depends on whether people are likely to be misled about the source of your cartoon. As long as no one thinks it's a Disney joint, there should be there should not be a trademark problem. Yes. Okay. Well, that may be true in a legal standpoint, but don't forget, companies, lawyers can sue for anything. Um, they have deep pockets, and uh, they may decide they're going to go after everything uh, to uh, um, basically prevent people from trying to use the character at all, even though legally um, they can. But it's something we'll talk about at the end there. Uh, when might consumers think you are offering a Disney-sponsored product? Here it is important to distinguish between different uses of the Mickey character. Certainly there might be a risk of confusion if you use Mickey as a brand identifier on the kind of merchandise Disney sells, which is everything. <laughs> really. Uh, trademark law does protect Disney against that risk. Consumers may be confused if Mickey is used in an artistic work in a way that suggests it is a Disney production. For example, by appearing as a logo at the beginning of an animation, like this. Contrast these uses with putting the Mickey character in a new cartoon or book, or a comic book, as I like to say. Uh, the latter is not the kind of use that misleads us to the source of a product. It is exactly what copyright expiration is intended to allow. Where trademark law were trademark law to prevent this, then trademark rights would be leveraged to obtain the effective equivalent of a perpetual copyright. That's what I was saying earlier. Uh, precisely what the Supreme Court said we cannot do. As mentioned earlier, one way to dispel potential confusion is to make it clear that you, and not Disney, are responsible for the new work, and to add a disclaimer making it clear that your work is not produced or sponsored by Disney. Okay, that's easy enough to do. Moving beyond the Mickey character, what about Disney's trademark over the Mickey Mouse name? Okay, now here's an important thing. A lot of people think um, you can't call him Mickey Mouse. Here, too, putting the words Mickey Mouse on toys or onesies is different from using Mickey Mouse to describe the content of a new creative work. With the latter, a disclaimer is also helpful. One court explained when a public domain work is copied along with its title, there is little likelihood to, of confusion when even the most minimal steps are taken to distinguish the publisher of the original from that of the copy. The public is receiving just what it believes it is receiving, the work with which the title has become associated. The public is not only unharmed, it is unconfused. It's like uh, using Sherlock Holmes' name or Dracula's name. Uh, with artistic uses of trademark material, the First Amendment's protection for freedom of expression also comes into play. Trademark law has a number of speech-protecting limitations that safeguard expressive uses. This is why when Mattel sues people for using Barbie in their title of, titles of songs and photographs, they lose in court. Mattel has also lost when it objected to the use of the doll's trademarked appearance in a series of photographs criticizing its role in our culture. One defense allows nominative use, nominative use of a trademark as a point of reference. For example, using Mickey Mouse accurately to refer to the public domain character in your work. Another comes from a case called Rogers vs. Grimaldi, which privileged the use of trademarks and titles of expressive works as long as the term has some artistic relevance to the new work and does not explicitly mislead as to the source of the work. The policy underlying this rule is that trademark law should only apply to artistic works when the public interest in avoiding consumer confusion outweighs the public interest in free expression. While a disclaimer is not required to benefit from these limitations, it can nevertheless be useful to make abundantly clear that you are not providing an official Disney pro production. I would put that crap all over my book, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right in the indicia, uh, right on the cover. Um, and, and everywhere, it was uh, uh, not an, uh, intrusive, just to cover, particularly in the beginning here.
Uh, finally, there's a small subset of extremely famous marks, essentially super brands that receive extra anti-dilution protection against unauthorized uses that impair the distinctiveness or harm the reputation of the famous work, even when there is no consumer confusion. Fame has a specialized meaning here. Only trademarks that are widely recognized by the general public as a brand signify or qualify. While the mouse ears silhouette or current iteration of the Mickey logo might fall into this category of famous marks, the Mickey character from Steamboat Willie does not. Just because a brand is famous for uh, trademark purposes does not mean that all of its trademarks are considered famous. Nike is famous, but only its product names are famous. Uh, and even if Mickey 1.0 does eventually qualify, anti-dilution protection is subject, subject to important First Amendment exceptions that allow for the kinds of expressive uses discussed earlier. Bottom line, trademark law has a number of rules designed to safeguard expressive uses and prevent trademark law from overriding copyright law. Nonetheless, People sometimes still try to use trademark law to interfere with legal issues of public domain material, leading to unnecessary litigation and chilling effects. Now, if you guys look up this article, save this paragraph, okay? Nonetheless, people sometimes still try to use trademark law to interfere and highlight the sentence, to interfere with legal reuses of public domain material, leading to unnecessary litigation and chilling effects. Zorro Productions and Edgar Rice Burroughs, Inc. did this with the Zorro works and the Tarzan and uh, John Carter works. Zorro lost in court because the Zorro story was in the public domain. A new Queen of Swords TV series about Zorro's sword-wielding daughter could proceed. Burroughs was able to extract a joint licensing deal from the publisher of new Lord of the Jungle and Warlord of Mars comic books. I believe that's dynamite. Uh, even the threat of lawsuits can chill creative use. Going forward, will Disney's legal actions reflect the relevant law enforcing only the rights it still owns, or will it try to stop what copyright expiration allows? That That is... Um, is what the tale of the tape is going to be, isn't it? Is what is Disney's lawyers going to do? Uh, are they are they going to you know uh, try to put out the fire uh, by overreaching? Uh, it's not like they hadn't done that before, you know, going after like uh, uh, children daycare centers because there's a painting of Mickey Mouse on the wall for the kids, you know, these kind of things. Think of all the works spawned by public domain stories and characters, whether it's Shakespeare's plays, Jane Austen's novels, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or Bram Stoker's Dracula. Shakespeare alone has inspired hundreds of new creations. Ten Things I Hate About You and Kiss Me Kate come from The Taming of the Shrew. West Side Story from Romeo and Juliet. Forbidden Planet from The Tempest. Shakespeare himself drew on his public domain predecessors. As a federal judge observed, if, if, if the underlying works were copyrighted, measure for measure would infringe uh, Promos and Cassandra. Ragtime would infringe Michael Colas, and Romeo and Juliet itself would have infringed Arthur Brooks' The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet, which in turn would have infringed several earlier Romeo and Juliets, all of which probably would have infringed Ovid's story of uh, Pyramus and Thisbe. That's deep stuff uh, that I don't know anything about. Uh, Disney and Mickey are part of this rich tradition, and in the end, Disney can continue to enjoy a plentiful intellectual property portfolio while also enriching the public domain. As mentioned earlier, Disney's wonderful works exemplify just how valuable the public domain is. It is... It has borrowed prolifically and brilliantly from the public domain. Disney frying, Disney fying, Disneyfying, <laughs> okay, older works to make its beloved films. The Three Musketeers came from Alexandre Dumas, A Christmas Carol from Charles Dickens, Beauty and the Beast from Gabrielle Suzanne uh, de Villeneuve. I probably butchered that, my French friends. Uh, Around the World in 80 Days from Jules Verne. 
Alice in Wonderland from Lewis Carroll, Snow White from the Brothers Grimm, Hunchback of Notre Dame from Victor Hugo, Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella from Charles Perrault, The Little Mermaid from Hans Christian Andersen, Pinocchio from Carlo Collodi, Huck Finn from Mark Twain, Robin Hood from English Lure, and Aladdin from the Book of 1001 Nights. Um, let us hope that Disney remembers its own debt to the public domain as Mickey Mouse enters the realm from which it has drawn so heavily. So, what did you guys think of that? It answers a lot of questions, doesn't it? All right, let's go back up here. See uh, what's talking and who's talking and all that good stuff. Okay, I didn't miss any super chats. All right, everybody seems to be saying hey to each other. Uh, Dr. Dr. Maska reminds everybody to pick yourself up a limited edition Chinoo plushie at Graham's site. Uh, the Chinoo is covered under copyright uh, for another 75 years uh, after I kick off. So, <laughs> uh, Nick is dead right here. Lion King also derives from an early anime called The White Lion. Uh, yeah, Simba. Uh, I used to watch that as a kid. I remember when The Lion King came out, I'm like, isn't that Simba? Nobody remembers that show. But I remember Gigantor, too, so I'm old. Uh, Dr. Mass says, I could be down with Mickey in space. I'm sure there's a there's a comic of him in space. Oh, yeah. I'd put him on all kinds of, like, adventures like Popeye did, you know. Uh, Julie just uh, said that a lot of folks are looking for the link. I'm going to put it in the comments right now. There you go. Link is in the comments, guys. Thanks, Jules. Uh, oh, I, I know what I was saying. Um, uh, you know, like when Popeye went to um, uh, with the Sea Hag uh, on that adventure with the Sea Hag and, and, and uh, the, the goon. Uh, I forget what the island was called. You know, it's a treasure thing. Um, there was they, they did the uh, was it Godfreydson who did those Mickey uh, comic strips with the Sky Pirates and stuff. You know, high adventure stuff would be a lot of fun to do with Mickey. I think. Cocaine Mickey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mickey Steamboats is Willie. <laughs> okay, there's a movie. Well, uh, they toned Mickey's personality down at one point when Mickey became the symbol of the Disney brand. Early Mickey is so much more fun. And that is so true with with any great character that takes off in the public eye uh, that becomes a brand for the company. Uh, Popeye is the first one that comes to mind. Uh, you read those early E.C. Seeger Popeye, Popeye uh, comics, and they are just balls to the wall fun. Uh, the, the, there's that uh, classic one where uh, uh, it was a Sunday. And Wimpy is uh, uh, chasing after this cow. And the very last panel, it's like this really long panel. Uh, uh, Wimpy is sitting there and he's got a meat grinder. And he's he's just churning out hamburgers. And um, uh, the, there's the head of the cow with X's in the eyes. His hooves sticking up, his tail. You know, oh, I think his tail sticking out of the meat grinder and stuff, you know. <laughs> it's just, it's just so, so awesome. You know, because you know who Wimpy is. You know, he's kind of a ne'er do well, uh, and he just loves those hamburgers. Uh, and uh, you, you never see that today. Uh, same thing with Superman. When Superman first came out, you know, he was he uh, he he was he was not the, the 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 Boy Scout, which everybody loves to call him today, which I can't stand. Uh, yeah, Superman was uh, uh, 
suffered from righteous indignation over the wrongs that were going on in the world. You know, scumbag politicians and uh, uh, wife beaters and, and uh, you know, uh, mad scientists and all that stuff, you know. He didn't spare. I mean, this is this is one Jack Burnley cover, which is so awesome, where uh, it, it's a Nazi sub and uh, you can see into the periscope what they're seeing. What they're seeing is Superman swimming towards the sub, you know, uh, 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 of, of the above the water. And he's like this. And he looks he looks really badass and angry, like, oh, man, these Nazis that are really going to get it. And the Nazis are like, ah, you know, <laughs> this guy's going to wrap up this submarine. That's great stuff. Uh, but you wouldn't see that today. So yeah, uh, Fritzy, not uncommon. Yes, you can use the name Mickey. Um, they, she, we, we covered that. Uh, but where in Ireland is your family from? Ah, uh, well, uh, both my grandparents uh, are from Ireland. Uh, one side, the Nolans, were from uh, Carlo, County Carlo. And uh, the Grahams were from, um, I think, Meath. I think it was Meath. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. If you can use the name Mickey Mouse or not. They seem to, the article uh, seemed to think that you could. If they called him Mickey Mouse at all in that, in that cartoon, uh, you know, like on the title card, it said, Hey, you know, introducing Mickey Mouse or something like that, or, yeah. Uh, then it would you could use it stat zero i'd rather just use something that's mine i would too i mean I, i'd rather create my own thing however um it is fun uh to uh incorporate some of these things sometimes um into your own work uh, I've done that before uh, in Sunshine State with uh, early on I used Popeye um, and uh, just this week uh, I used uh, Mickey. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll show you what I used it for if you haven't seen it. Let's see. There we go. Uh, I think I'm the first cartoonist to use the character, uh, uh, when it, uh, went into public domain. Why do I say that? Because I created this on Sunday and it posted at midnight. So you'd have to be pretty damn quick. Um, to post it on the Go Comics site. Uh, uh, so if, if somebody got out there ahead of me, it'd be pretty surprising, but whatever. Anyway, I had fun uh, doing this and integrating the character into my uh, into my strip. Uh, it's thanks to George Lucas not getting the rights to do Buck Rogers. Actually, it was uh, it was Flash Gordon that inspired him to create Star Wars. Yeah, I mean it's the same plot. You know, if, if I said to you, uh, you know, uh, a young man, um, you know, leaves his home world to fight a, a galactic despot. Um, yeah, that's Star Wars, but it's also um, Flash Gordon. Same thing with Calvin and Hobbes. You know, if I said oh, a young boy and his stuffed animal goes on, you know, all kinds of adventures, it's Winnie the Pooh also. It's all about um, the presentation. You know, you can take a lot of a, a lot of elements that are the same 
and present them differently and it becomes something completely different. being able to use Captain Marvel with the exception of the name being on the cover. Yeah. That I am so angry that, <laughs> that uh, uh, they let uh, the Captain Marvel title expire and, and Marvel was able to buy it up. Uh, yeah, Fritzy, uh, it's, um, uh, Captain Marvel, the CC Beck version came out in 1940, 40, 41, 40. Um, so if Superman was 38 and that's going to be 2034, it'd be what, 2036, uh, the Captain Marvel would fall into uh, public domain, but not the name. Or not the, you know, you couldn't have it at the title because that's a newer copyright and trademark under Marvel Comics. Which is why in 1972, when DC got the rights from Fawcett, uh, they couldn't put Captain Marvel on the cover uh, as a title of the book. So that's why they called it Shazam. Now everybody calls him Shazam. And DC's even changed his name to Shazam, I think, so... Captain Marvel died in 1953, just like Star Trek died in 1973. <laughs> I'm a hard ass. Hey, Anzac, thank you for the $5 super chat. I remember Simba, but I'm effing old as hell as well. Uh, it's better to be old than dead. So thank you, sir. Chris Juliano, with all this transpiring, would it make a film like Who Framed Roger Rabbit easier to make today? Uh, well, of all the cartoon characters that were in there, there wasn't a whole lot that would still be under uh, uh, public domain yet. I mean, down the, years down the road, perhaps. Uh, yeah, so I got it right. It was Floyd Gottfriedson. Uh, hey, Guy. Guy Dorian Sr. is here. He says, I expect Disney to really hit hard at people at the beginning of the public domain as they have had a heavy hand against any use in any way of anything they own. That's very true. This is why, you know, I, uh, I say, you know, tread lightly. Make sure you got your, your ass covered. In anything you decide to use, uh, uh, Mickey Mouse from Steamboat Willie in. Oh, well, Dr. Mass says that uh, Disney's already going after the horror movie guy. Wow, that didn't take long, did it? Oh, Angela Curry is here. Hello, Angela. Ah, oh, title card says Mickey Mouse and Steamboat Willie. Then you can use the name. Oh, thanks, Dr. Mask. Yeah, I had fun with that. I had thought about coloring the mouse too. Uh, and then I started reading the article in depth and I realized, you know what? Uh, I will heed my own advice and tread lightly here. Um, and, uh, do them in black and white, uh, just to cover my rear, but I'm sort of doubly 
doubly covered. Um, yes, it, it's uh, in public domain, but I'm covered under satire because I'm using the character in a satirical way of him showing up in my strip. Um, and we're sort of making fun of, of uh, his predicament and all that kind of stuff. So I had double coverage there, but uh, I just wanted to be safe. Uh, while Sean, Sean Gordon Murphy was promoting his new Zorro comic on Instagram, someone in the comments mentioned that Zorro was in the public domain. Murphy insisted wrongly that it was not. <laughs> well, if he's paying uh, any kind of licensing fee to, the, to that guy, he's a dummy. <laughs> it clearly is, and they talked about that in the article, you know. But uh, they seem to be, uh, the people that own that seem to be somewhat litigious you know uh, and going after anybody who uses anything with it even though you're allowed to well that's the that's the problem that's the threat is that you know these guys got lawyers on a uh, retainer you know they have armies of them uh they're getting paid on monday whether they're in court with you or not and so you know it it it, it, it doesn't uh, affect them one bit to uh, drag you into court hoping to bleed you out you know, and get you to uh, capitulate because, uh, you know, you don't have the, the resources to uh, to fight it. And uh, even if you did, you know, and you win it, what do you win? You just spent years in court and a ton of money um, for something that's not going to make you the money, you know, more than likely. So it's a, it's, it's a sticky thing. And, you know, I kind of like dealt with some of that with Warner Brothers in the past. And all it does is give you Ajina. Buck Rogers is another screwy public domain situation. You can't call the character Buck, from what I understand. How about Suck? Can you call him suck Rogers? <laughs> Maybe make a space porno film. That ought to get them going. <laughs> yeah, you could team up with Mickey and Winnie the Pooh. And Tigger, too. Yeah, uh, uh, did Tigger come in um, this year too with Mickey, or or was it previous? Hey, Agamemnon Fireman says hi, Graham. Oh, Agamemnon. Uh, Smiller got a copyright strike from Disney for playing Steamboat Willie. Uh, did he play it before Monday? Because, uh, yeah, you could, he, he, he could um, argue that one. You know, those guys are probably, you know, all that stuff, all those strikes and stuff come from algorithms. It's not like somebody's sitting there watching every stream, you know, looking for, you know, use of their characters. The algorithm algorithms pull that and um, and then you have to, uh, you know, argue it, your fair use or whatever it may be, a license, whatever the case may be. And uh, uh, that's probably what happened if he if he if he played it uh, prior or a uh, post uh, January 1st. Someone had a really funny idea about making a film noir buddy cop story with Felix the Cat and Mickey Mouse. Knowing the cool stuff Italy and France do with Disney stuff and comics, I'd pay for it. I'd be down with that. That would be cool. And Felix with his bag of tricks, he could pull out, you know, you know, 
automatic weapons and stuff if he needed it or rocket launchers you know he can just dig into that bag and pull out all some really cool stuff that could be fun uh just inside says it was a today apparently yeah again i i think it's the algorithms that are catching that um they haven't been changed yeah all right well Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in to this, what I hope was a educational uh, show today uh, about copyrights and, and trademarks and Disney in particular. Um, if you're a creative out there listening, uh, watching it now live or, or catching it later on, you know, uh, the the link to the article is, is, is in the chat here. Uh, so, you know, if, if you need it, go research it, read it. Uh, and bone up before you decide to do anything. Uh, you don't want to get uh, the army of lawyers, you know, uh, crashing down on you. So uh, make sure you got your rear covered. Um, just do your homework, you know, which I, I think is a good idea for anything that you do, you know, so you don't uh, run into some troubles. Uh, so anyway, it was, uh, it was great being back again and uh, streaming uh, after the new year. This will become a, a regular thing again for me. Um, uh, I, I missed it, and uh, I love doing the Storyteller Show. So uh, I've got some stuff lined up I want to do. But, you know, when something like this is topical and comes up, you know, uh, I thought it would be a great idea to, to tap into this. So uh, you guys have a great night. Um, what else? What else is something I wanted to tell you guys? Uh, oh, um, we have a tentative a ship date for uh, Ghost of Matacumba Key. Looks like the end of January. Um, the books will ship here and we can begin uh, the uh, process of, of um, uh, fulfillment on that. Um, if you haven't seen, we've got uh, a bunch of stuff coming up in 2024. Uh, uh, Return to Monster Island is the next one that'll be coming up out of the gate. Probably launch that in February. Uh, then I've got the, the third part to Joe Frankenstein, uh, which Chuck and I are working on now, which is uh, Joe Frankenstein, the Eye of Ra. It's going to be a high ad adventure tale in Egypt. And, uh, and then the third part of the Monster Island trilogy, Escape from Monster Island, uh, will, uh, should all be done uh, this, this coming uh, fiscal year of 2024. So Compass Comics is on the move. We got a lot of cool stuff lined up and uh, really appreciate all you guys uh, tuning into the shows and, and backing the projects. Uh, can't do it without you, as you know, and uh, I really appreciate you guys. So happy new year as we started off today and uh, have a great night. We'll see y'all. Bye-bye.